In that case, let's get started. So, uh, let's get started with what this presentation is actually going to be about and what we're going to cover here. So, uh, thank you to everyone for coming, first of all. Uh, secondly, this pr presentation will assume sort of an intermediate knowledge of how debating operates. So, if you're unfamiliar with sort of the very basics of what debating is in any format like BP or 3v3 or so on, or if you are unfamiliar with, for example, how to make an argument and so on, this presentation might not be the most helpful for you. So it might be useful to come back to this later. This is more about sort of advanced concepts and strategy and how to actually win debates. Thirdly, uh, if you have questions at any point in time, please let me know in the chat. Uh, I'll stop and answer them then and there. Uh, and in particular, if you don't understand anything about the presentation, definitely ask, I'll try and explain it in a different way. That's probably the most useful way to take advantage of this presentation. So uh, all that being said, let's get started. So what is this presentation actually about? So lots of seminars I've seen so far tend to focus on discrete skills. So either they're about how to give an extension speech or a whip speech or how to debate economics or religion and so on. All of those things are useful in improving at those individual skills. But what I thought would be useful to provide is sort of a broader overview of how debating operates in general and how to evaluate the specific places where you actually need improvement, work out where to improve and how to track whether you are improving well uh, and what exactly you should be doing in order to improve. So why does this matter? If you can see here, uh, I think the graph that I've put up does a pretty good job of actually identifying what it looks like to get better at debating. So. At the start, you see there's like pretty strong exponential gains because you're a noob uh, and very small improvements tend to have relatively large effects in making you better. Each speech you give uh, ends up making you a lot better. Uh, but you quickly begin to run into a period of plateaus. Uh, and that is the problem. You sort of, uh, you know, get better, then get a bit lost, something clicks and suddenly you get better. And that process repeats itself. Uh, James Stratton, who I stole this graph off of, calls that sputtery improvement. The problem with that is obviously it is not very directed and therefore it's somewhat random. It's not very much within your control and therefore is a relatively inefficient way to improve. So the goal of this is to allow you to have a more directed form of self-improvement. That means that you'll be able to do so faster and more efficiently. So keeping that in mind, what is sort of the key takeaways that I'll hope that I hope you'll be able to get from this presentation. So ideally, three things you should be able to, at the end of this presentation, understand how the process of adjudication actually operates, not just how it's theoretically meant to operate. Secondly, you should be able to understand what determines whether or not you win or lose debate. And thirdly, you should have a good mechanism to understand how to evaluate your own performance and for how to get better feedback from adjudicators. So hopefully everyone at the end of this session will be able to do those three things. Okay, so the core of this presentation then, how you actually win a debate. So there's a technical answer for this and a useful answer. Technical answer is just, well, the team that wins a debate is the team that is most persuasive with regard to the motion in question and the rules of the format of debating, whether that be BP or Asians or whatever. But that is very obvious and very unhelpful. The actual question uh, that people really wanna know is like, what do I need to do in order to win debates and not lose debates? The answer to that uh, that I think is very helpful is actually what you want to do is avoid losing the debate. So this presentation will actually focus on what are the ways in which people lose debates, why do those things cause you to lose debates, and how can you avoid doing them in the first place? So there are sort of three key ways in which people lose debates. One, they lose debates due to poor strategy. Two, they lose debates due to poor analysis. And three, they lose debates due to poor comprehension. So the bulk of this presentation will be going through each of those three things in turn and looking at what they mean, how to avoid doing them and why you should avoid doing them. Uh, and that will hopefully be very useful to everyone in terms of losing fewer debates. Okay, so let's start with strategy then. What is the big idea here in terms of strategy? Essentially, you could think of the process of adjudication kind of like uh, a relatively simple maths operation, right? Like all the adjudicator is really doing at the end of the day is evaluating each team and sort of adding up the harms and benefits that they prove 
uh, weighing in any principles as sort of a multiplier on those harms and benefits, and then comparing those teams to see who comes up with the bigger number at the end of the day. The team that wins is the one that proves like the biggest harms or the biggest benefits with regard to the motion after you account for principles and so on. And so that simple operation determines who wins, or at least in theory does so. So the question you need to ask yourself is, does the case that you have presented in the debate logically allow for you to win? Like, does the case that you have, like, if everything you've said is believed to be true by the adjudicator, the adjudicator would accept every premise in the argument you make, is it logically possible for you to win the debate? If the answer to that question is no, then you have lost the debate before you've even gotten up to speak. And that is a significant strategic flaw that you should attempt to avoid having in the first place. So, uh, let's take a look at sort of what does that mean? So basically the big idea here is you want to make sure that you like the arguments you make are sufficiently large and impactful enough and operate strategically in the debate in a way that if they are proven successfully by you in the debate, you will then logically have to win the debate. And that is something that a lot of teams do not do. They sort of just think of harms or benefits. They just sort of think in prep time of possible reasons in support of or against the policy and then just say them. There's no real broader strategic thought or overview as to which arguments should we pick and how do those arguments actually get us to the victory in the debate. So that being said, there are a couple of very easy strategies that you can employ very successfully that if you then successfully are able to prove all of the necessary premises of your case will ensure that you have to win the debate or at least have to win the team that you use the strategy against. So I've worked through a couple of examples here. Uh, usefully, these are all tied. So for each uh, sort of example of a strategy, I've got an actual debate that it ties into, which I'll explain to sort of uh, color the example. And secondly, all of the debates that I'm using as examples are debates that exist on YouTube and are of very high quality. So I highly recommend that everyone go and watch those debates after this seminar, if you have not already, or at some point in time, they're all some of the best examples of debating that exist. Uh, and I think you'll get a lot out of them in that way. So the first strategy that you can apply to win a debate is really just to identify a harm or a benefit that is so large in the debate that if successfully proven, outweighs any other possible argument that can be made. Now, a really good example of this is uh, the quarterfinals of Malaysia Australs in 2018 between USU1 and Ateneo1. It's a very good debate. And the topic is about whether or not uh, it's like that we should restrict people from accessing opioids unless they have on an objective scale, uh, a level of pain that is above a six out of 10. And uh, USU1 in this debate, which is uh, Steph White, James Stratton and Imogen Harper, probably one of the best 3v3 teams ever to debate. Their strategy is essentially to identify that the overprescription of pain relief drugs like opioids has resulted in the opioid crisis and that it's killed hundreds of thousands of people. So if they can demonstrate that this policy eliminates that harm, then that is so significantly large that it ought outweigh every other concern in the debate. And that is effectively what happens in the debate. They successfully prove that this would prevent the overprescription of opioid drugs, that that would prevent hundreds of thousands of deaths uh, and a huge amount of suffering. And despite the fact that the negative team raises a whole bunch of very sophisticated and very good arguments, uh, they are unable to win for that reason. UC1 is able to identify a very large benefit. They're able to really hammer it home and nothing the opposition team does is sufficient to win. So that is a really good example of a strategy that you can apply. Obviously, there are limited circumstances in which that is applicable for the reason that not every debate has an incredibly large benefit or harm. And secondly, even when there are large benefits and harms available in debates, often it is not clear that they cannot be outweighed by any other consideration. Like often there are good principled arguments or all sorts of other good reasons to believe that even a very large benefit or harm is not the most important thing on any metric. So that is a useful way to win debates where it is available, but does not always exist. Let's talk about this second one then, which is uh, co-opting opposition metrics. This one is incredibly cool because it basically is very obvious why you should win. What you're doing is just identifying 
sort of the metric that the other team has set up for what the debate is about, and then just explaining why you do better on their own metric. So if opposition says that the debate is about improving education quality, if you prove on side negative that you actually get better education policy by not implementing their motion, then it is very obvious why you've won the debate because you've proven that you do the thing that opposition wants to do much better. So incredibly effective way for beating teams on the other, uh, on opposition. Obviously in formats like British parliamentary, that will not help you beat the team uh, that is on the same side as you necessarily. So keep that in mind. So good example of this, uh, of this strategy in action is at Thailand Worlds 2020 in the quarterfinal, the debate that has Stanford at opening government, Yale A at opening opposition, and then Zagreb A and Macquarie A in closing half respectively. The topic is about uh, that developing countries should essentially buy large stakes in major corporations within the Fortune 500. So companies like Johnson, Johnson, Apple, Tesla, and so on. Now, opening government makes the argument that it's very important that these companies invest in these uh, the, sorry, the developing countries invest in these companies because it'll allow them access to money and uh, that is important for development. Opening opposition wins the top half exchange very clearly by explaining why, even if that was the goal of, or that, that was the desired goal of developing countries, which they do also contest, this is in fact an incredibly poor way to go about achieving that goal. So the argument that opening opposition makes here is to say that if you as a developing country wanted to invest in something in order to gain a return, investing in major corporations is just about the worst thing you could invest in. Because uh, when the market is down, that's when you need money the most, but you won't have access to it because all your money will have been lost at that point in time. Because these are companies that are likely to exert significant amount of control over you and so on and so forth. All of which has the effect of explaining why the one thing that opening government sets out to do is in fact harmed as a result of the policy, which very clearly explains why you should get up over that team. So that's a very effective explanation uh, of that strategy. Uh, uh, that's a very effective way to win the debate. Sort of the third thing you can do is use a non-contingent principle. This is very straightforward. All you need to do is identify why, uh, for example, a policy is immoral or in some way, or you know, morally required in a very strong way in order to win the debate. Uh, I think a really good example of this strategy is uh, Newcastle Euros in 2009 in the semi-final. Sheng Wu wins a debate from member of opposition. The, the debate is about whether or not uh, like this house believes that it's legitimate to bomb religious sites in times of war. Sheng Wu's speech is incredibly simple. It's just an explanation about why this is immoral, why it is a violation of human dignity and therefore impermissible to engage in this policy. Regardless of any practical benefit that does occur, it is something that we cannot stand by and therefore it's something that cannot occur. Obviously, very powerful strategy. You just prove that the moral dimension of, of uh, that is so important that no level of benefit can possibly outweigh the principle. Obviously, the important consideration here is one, proving that the principled obligation does in fact exist. And secondly, proving that is sufficiently important in this particular instance that it does outweigh it. But assuming you are able to do those things, an incredibly powerful strategy for winning overall. The last thing, uh, sort of the last strategy that you can use is combining a contingent principle with a practical argument that pairs up with it. So essentially you're setting up with your principled argument what the metric of the debate is. You're explaining why we should prioritize one particular thing over everything else, and then explaining why it is that your side of the motion allows you to prioritize that thing in a practical fashion. Uh, a great example of this is the grand final of Zagreb Euros in 2014. Adam Hawksby from Sheffield A is a member of opposition in this debate. And it's uh, that the feminist movement should oppose wars fought in the interests of improving the conditions of women. And the argument that closing opposition makes in this debate is just that one, in terms of principle, the feminist movement has an obligation to prioritize pragmatic considerations. So it should do whatever helps achieve the best feminist outcomes. And that is because the movement has incredibly strong obligation to women. And when it fails to meet that obligation, obviously that is a failure of the purpose of the movement in the first place. And then an explanation as to why opposing these wars on net 
severely damages the political capital of the movement for no real gain in practical terms beyond sort of principally feeling like they're doing the right thing. Really good example of tying a contingent principle using it to set a metric and then practically demonstrating why you win on that particular metric. So those are sort of broadly the ways you can go about uh, what I like to call win conditions. They are strategies that if successfully implemented logically must result in you winning the debate. And that is something that is very important to keep in mind during prep time in particular, because far too many teams don't have any sense of overarching strategy. They just sort of run in with a set of arguments and try and like rebut their way to victory. That's obviously very hard to do, particularly if you're in the top half of the debate. You can't really predict or respond to what is going to happen after you in the debate. So it's very important to tie your arguments together in a way that logically explains why you are winning in advance. Like you want your debate, your arguments to speak to the core of the motion and to logically explain why you need to win that motion. And that sort of strategic thinking will put you significantly further ahead. So sort of the key takeaway from this section is firstly, ensure going into the debate that it is logically possible, and in fact, logically very likely that if your argument is true, you will win the debate. Make sure you don't run cases that even if the judge believes everything you say, it is unclear why your case is important or relevant enough to win the debate. That is a significant mistake a large number of teams make, and it means that they just can't win the debate. Secondly, keep in mind, obviously, it's not possible to win every debate from a strategy point of view. Like maybe your opening just says, everything there is to say, you're probably not gonna beat them in that debate. Still apply this, these strategies and attempt to take the second, like work out how you're gonna beat the teams on opposition using the same things. Or maybe it's the case that like the motion is really one-sided and you can't beat the opposition bench. But you can beat the other team on your bench. Still, regardless of what the situation in the debate is, you can still think of a strategy to achieve an aim, even if that aim is taking the second or the third rather than the fourth, that is still a reason to have a strategy for how you're going to get there. The last thing to say uh, on strategy is at the end of the debate then, the way you can evaluate uh, how your strategy was is to ask yourself, one, like, did the strategy we employed allow us to win the debate? If our case had been believed in its entirety, does that lead to the obvious, is the obvious conclusion that, well, if you believe this, then obviously we win the debate. If not, perhaps reevaluate. And secondly, often useful to ask yourself, was there a more efficient case we could have run? Like, was there a much easier way to win the debate that we could have thought of? Was this the most useful case we could have run? And those sort of intuitions will lead you to being more strategic over time. So broadly, that is strategy out of the way. Let's then move on to the next place where people tend to fall down. Uh, so that is in terms of analysis. So analysis is very straightforward, right? This is just ensuring that you actually prove the things that you set out to prove. So you'll have certain harms and benefits or certain principled arguments you'll like to make. Analysis is just about ensuring that you actually do prove those things. The absence of actually proving the argument, very hard to win. Like you might have identified the correct set of arguments, strategically might all be optimal. You do not then go and do the work necessary to prove that those arguments are true. You cannot win the debate. Uh, obviously, I'm not gonna talk about every form of, of way you can ensure you have good analysis or improve your analysis. That's at least three different seminars right there. But I will go over some of the key pitfalls that people tend to run into with analysis that prevent them from doing particularly well in debates. So the first thing is ensure that you actually run uh, a, 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 and have robust arguments in the first place. What that means is ensure that you actually provide analysis for all key parts of the argument. So firstly, ensure that you provide characterization for the argument to explain who the argument is about and what context the argument occurs in. In the absence of that characterization, your arguments are often far less relevant to the debate, or it is unclear why they're relevant. And secondly, they're often just far less powerful in the context of the debate. That is something that where possible, you want to avoid doing. Secondly, obviously, you want to make sure that you provide a large number of mechanisms for your argument. The more mechanisms, the more clearly uh, delineated those mechanisms are, the more likely that argument is to survive the rebuttal of the other team. 
the more likely it is to be believed by the adjudicator. And lastly, and, and really the thing that teams forget most often is impacting. So explain at the end of the argument, why is the consequence that we've demonstrated is true with our characterization and mechanisms, something that is either good or bad, and why is it something that is important? Large number of teams really fall down at this part. Either they take for granted that the consequence that they've demonstrated is in fact good or bad, which is a huge mistake. Uh, there is all practical arguments require some sort of explanation as to why that consequence is desirable or undesirable. In the absence of that explanation, things like a certain consequence could be either good or bad. For example, in a debate about the criminal justice system, you might demonstrate practically that a consequence of a policy is that criminals receive harsher punishment. This argument is not clearly a harm or a benefit. It could be either. You could make the argument that uh, criminals are currently underpunished in the status quo and that it is therefore morally correct that they receive harsher punishments. You could also make the, the argument that criminals are adequately punished and a harsher punishment is not only immoral, but harmful to the process of rehabilitation. Depending on the surrounding context that you provide for the argument and the principles that underpin the debate, any individual consequence could be either a good or bad thing. So make sure you explain and provide that underlying analysis and principle in order to identify why the consequences that you present are in fact good or bad. And secondly, ensure that you do in fact explain why your arguments are important. Lots of teams sort of take for granted that the things that they are proving are important in the debate, but it is not always necessarily clear that that is the case. Uh, and your failure to do that will be detrimental when judges weigh up arguments because uh, they obviously, uh, it's kind of subjective how you weigh up arguments. In the absence of you explaining why your argument should be weighted heavily, you run the risk that the adjudicator chooses not to weigh it heavily or just doesn't like the argument or feels like uh, you know, the analysis wasn't good or so on. So make sure you do that work for the adjudicator. That is sort of the first thing to keep in mind in terms of analysis. The second thing you wanna keep in mind uh, Yep, there we go. Second thing you want to keep in mind is relevance. Another big problem that I've noticed lots of teams have, make sure that your arguments do in fact logically connect to the debate at hand. Oftentimes teams will run arguments uh, that are sort of like tangential to the debate in question, or it's unclear why we really care about those effects, or it is unclear that those effects really do result uh, from the topic. Those are obviously very easy ways to lose the debate. So make sure that, that what you're doing is related to the debate. And in particular, the place where that, uh, that problem uh, often manifests itself is when it comes to things like principled arguments. Often teams will either fail to adequately complete the analysis to explain why the principled obligation or right exists, or that principle will just be somewhat tangential to the debate. Like it'll be unclear why demonstrating that people have a right to X or an obligation to do X matters in the debate, either because uh, the debate is like an actor debate and it's unclear why the actor cares about the principle or just because the principle, principle is uh, something that is non-contentious or non-mutually exclusive and so on. So ensure that your analysis is actually relevant to the debate and that it's contentious. Don't waste time proving things that the other team will just agree with. Uh, thirdly, you want to make sure that you have a uh, solid uh, rebuttal, obviously. So uh, rebuttal is very important. Firstly, for the reason that other teams will attack your argument. If you need the argument to be true in order to win the debate, like it probably should be, you shouldn't be running arguments that are unnecessary. Then your strategy relies on your arguments standing till the end of the debate. That means that you need to deal with any responses that are given to your arguments. And you need to have a good read for prioritizing what parts of other teams' cases are important and what are not. So make sure that you do things like defend your own arguments from responses. Make sure that you kill any arguments made by other teams that get in the way of your arguments being true or get in the way of you executing your win conditions and therefore winning the debate. Lots of teams either spend too much time rebutting things that ultimately don't matter in the debate at the expense of whipping their own material or uh, they spend too much time in their own material and do not adequately deal with the responses that have been given to their case. 
That is why strategy is particularly important. When you have an overall strategic goal for how you're going to win the debate, it should clue you in onto where you need to spend your time and how you ought to engage in prioritization within the context of your speech that will result in speeches that are much more concise, much tighter and much better focused. So keep that in mind. What is the sort of overall conclusion for this pitfall in debating? So like one, make sure you actually prove the things you set out to prove, make sure the things you prove are relevant to the debate, make sure that you do rebuttal. Uh, how can you sort of evaluate how your analysis is? This is an easy one. Just watch out in the OA for what the adjudicator says about your arguments. Like, did they believe your mechanisms? Did they think there was insufficient mechanization? Was their characterization missing? These are all things that adjus all are, are, are highly likely and definitely should be pointing out in the adjudication itself. So it is an easy one to, to sort of evaluate and work out whether you did this well or badly. Uh, okay, let's move on to sort of the last pitfall then, which is that of comprehension. Okay, so comprehension. What is the problem here? So basically, overall, the idea here is that the judge has to understand what you are saying before they can credit it. So the big barrier to you winning the debate here is just that like, you can't win with an argument that the judge does not understand. So you really need to ensure that the judge does understand everything that you say. If the judge does not understand what you are saying, then you have lost the debate because it doesn't matter how good your arguments actually are. It doesn't matter if, every, if your rebuttal does actually disprove all of the other team's case. It doesn't matter how good your impacting is. The judge doesn't understand what you've done. They cannot possibly credit it. You cannot possibly win the debate. You're in a really bad position there. So this is something that you definitely want to be able to avoid. So what does that look like? Obviously, easy ways to improve your comprehension are things like having good structure, signposting your arguments, being very clear, having nice rhetoric, using analogies and examples and so on. These are all things that, that debaters are particularly familiar with. Like none of these, these things should be surprising, but to a very large extent, uh, and particularly I've noticed in an online debating context, people don't seem to do these things. Like people often will talk incredibly fast during the debate with the understanding that it would allow them to say more, not recognizing that the trade-off there is maybe they say more, but if the adage understands less of it, you haven't really gotten any benefit out of it in the first place. Like make sure that you're, what you're saying is incredibly clear make sure that the ad will actually be able to keep up and follow and understand it. In particular, there is actually very little strategic benefit from talking particularly fast for the reason that the vast majority of speeches are at least 50% are dead weight. Like at least 50% of the things you're saying are unnecessary or repetitive. They can be cut out. It's far better to focus on making your speeches more efficient and improving your word economy than attempting to speak faster beyond a certain point, you're actually just destroying your clarity uh, and there are diminishing uh, and sometimes negative returns to doing that. So keep that in mind. The second thing to keep in mind here though, uh, so the first thing at uh, the conclusion of that first argument is just like, remember that debating is about persuasion at the end of the day. Uh, you do wanna be persuasive to people. So keep in mind that things like, you know, rhetoric still do matter. Obviously it's not the be all and end all of debating. Like you should have the arguments to back it up. Teams should not win purely on the basis of rhetoric, but rhetoric is an important part of debating. You should sound nice and persuasive when you argue. Keep those things in mind. Those things will help, will help adjudicators understand what you're saying and will result in you winning more debates. Second thing to say is uh, something called the sociological uh, perspective. Another term I've just sort of stolen off uh, James Stratton from his presentation about extensions, because I think it's a very good way to frame the problem. Uh, and that is just that in the discussion of strategy, we looked at sort of how adjudication operates as sort of like a mathematical equation. That is theoretically how it should operate. Like if every judge appropriately followed the judging manual, then that is the result. The problem is that that does not occur. Like judges do not just follow the manual, Judges are not robot, uh, like are not robots. They aren't going to do things perfectly, and they are, in fact, you know, pretty flawed. They're human, and so on. So that is something that you should account for, right? Like, adjus 
have all sorts of other things on their mind. Most judges probably aren't really paying uh, 100% attention during every speech. Like they're probably tired, they're probably bored. They probably want to go eat something or do something else. Maybe they're on their phone, like in online debating, who knows? Uh, maybe they're not the smartest adj, you know, all sorts of things could exist that mean that the adjudicator is playing imperfect attention or is not really considering what you're saying. And that is just sort of the unfortunate reality of, of how humans operate. What that means is you need to account for those things and ensure that you are understood despite that, which means that there is a premium on ensuring that your arguments are incredibly simple, for example. Like, even if it is logically the case that uh, your case results in you winning the debate, it is still possible that the adjudicator does not give it to you for the reason that it is so difficult to explain why your argument wins a debate that they'd rather not do it. Because adjudicators, like, do want to do a good job in adjudicating, obviously. Like, I think they do have an interest in getting the correct results. They obviously also have other interests, right? Like they don't want to be thought of as stupid by the teams. They want to get good feedback. Uh, they don't want to look stupid in front of the edge core uh, and so on. And that means that they're likely to do things that uh, achieve those interests and are sometimes contrary to the interests of the debaters. Like that is why you get things like uh, rep-based calls because it is much easier to justify that call and you're likely to get better feedback as a result out of it. That is obviously undesirable, but it is an unfortunate reality. And that means that if you can do things like be very clear and simple in your strategy and ensure that you tell the adjudicator why you have won the debate in a very clear way. You're far more likely to actually be rewarded with a win because uh, if it is very difficult for the adj to understand why you're winning the debate, then it is far more uh, likely that the adj will just not give you the win. If it is uh, more mentally taxing to understand sort of the overall way in which your arguments interact with other teams, you're relying on the ad to do that work. Maybe they'll be lazy and they won't do that work. You're relying on uh, you know, the adjudicator to do lots of work for you, then that is a bad idea. So don't do that. Make sure you spoon feed the adjudicator. And often the other reason this is very useful is uh, at large tournaments in particular, there are a large number of panelists that are also judging you. While the chair has the final say, their capacity to persuade those panelists is limited considering they're under time pressure. Uh, and often they might just give up and so on. So it is very useful if you can just get those panelists on side. Those panelists might not be capable of following very sophisticated chains of argumentation. So dumbing things down and explaining why you've won the debate to them is a very good way to ensure that you aren't fighting against the panelists uh, or your chair doesn't have to fight against panelists in deliberation room. The last thing in terms of that is uh, a very useful thing is to have a very snappy conclusion. We sort of very concisely are able to articulate why you have won the debate with the arguments you put together. Uh, and a speaker is very good at doing that is uh, Jimmy Stratton. If any of you have watched any of his speeches, he gives a very concise, but very persuasive explanation as to why they have to win the debate in sort of the last 10 to 15 seconds of uh, his speeches. And that is a really good way to remain memorable in the panelists' minds considering that they're listening to a lot of analysis, if you can sort of stick in their minds and be memorable in a way, that is something that is likely to give significant returns. So attempt to do that wherever that is possible. Okay, um, sort of the last thing to say here is just that uh, many judges are just bad at adjudicating. Many judges are just like dumb. That is unfortunate, but it is really like your problem because you're the one who has to, has to cop it if you get one of those judges. Uh, at the end of the day, no matter like how bad the edges are adjudicating or, or you know, how silly their metric for judging the debate is, you could have done something that could have won them over, right? Like there is still a causal relationship between your performance and your results, even if it is not a one-to-one -one relationship. Like maybe you have to overcome a set of biases like reputation biases, ESL bias, and so on. but you debating better will result in you getting better results. And that means that even if the judge is stupid, you should look at the ways you could still have won that debate and still have won them over. Uh, so sort of the key takeaway from comprehension is you want to one, make sure that you are actually putting some attention into being easy to understand. This is a significant part of winning debates, but is one that uh, people very rarely discuss, very rarely apply, and people are sort of reluctant to discuss it 
for the fear that uh, they're playing into sort of like language bias and so on. Like, obviously, you should not give people wins in debates purely on the basis of their language, but being rhetorically sound is an important part of debating and is not one that should be entirely ignored. Uh, but secondly, in particular, try and understand why, uh, if the reason you're losing debates is related to not your analysis or your strategy, but just that adjudicators are not understanding what you're saying, because that is an in independent problem. So often, if, the, if it is not clear from the OA, it can be useful to go to the judge and ask them, uh, did you understand this argument? Uh, if they did not credit it, for example, you can ask, why didn't you not credit it? And maybe it is because they did not understand the argument. And then you know in the future that the argument was fine, you just need to find a better way to explain it, perhaps using an analogy that is easy to understand, perhaps dumbing it down or whatever. You wanna understand why it is that the argument is failing. Is it because the argument wasn't proven? Is it because the argument was just bad or was it because the adjudicator did not understand? And very often it's just that the adjudicator did not understand what you're trying to get to. Uh, and that might be partly your fault, might be partly the judge's fault. At the end of the day, if you wanna win, you should fix the problem. So that is something to consider. So that is sort of the third way that people lose debates. So either poor strategy, poor analysis, or poor comprehension. So having sort of understood all of this, what does that mean for you? Well, uh, the first thing I think it means is that you can now engage in much better self-evaluation. Uh, and there are sort of three key places that you can do that. The first thing it means is that after the debate, you can just ask yourself, using these particular metrics, how did I do in this debate? Did I have a good strategy for winning the debate? Or was it obvious after watching uh, three other teams in a BP debate, for example, one of which is on your own bench, that there were better sets of arguments to have been run? Maybe we sort of misidentified the key stakeholder. Maybe we misidentified the key clashes. Maybe there was something else we should have done. That is a really useful strategic insight that you can then use the next time you get a similar debate. Or maybe we sort of, we were like broadly on the correct path, but there was just a more efficient way to win the debate. Like we did something overly complex that was unnecessary. Uh, this is a really easy one to assess in uh, BP debates because there are so many other teams in debate. It's very easy to compare yourself to them. <coughs> In 3v3 debates, often, you know, like both teams can just have a bad strategy or so on. It's not as apparent. You should ask yourself, like having seen sort of the types of arguments that came out, in hindsight, what could we have run that would have won the debate? Uh, and that is likely to get you far better results. The second thing that you want to do is sort of check during the OA. So uh, listen to what the judge is saying and sort of identify what did the judge seem to identify as problems with your case? Did they think that things were poorly proven or impacted or characterized? Like, was your analysis bad? Was it that they agreed that everything you said was true, but just didn't see how that amounted to a win for you? In which case, it's a strategic problem. Or did they just seem confused by what you were saying? In which case, maybe it's a comprehension problem. Uh, and the third thing is, you then want to be able to go uh, and talk to the ads during feedback and work out sort of uh, in individual feedback, what was it uh, that went wrong? Where did you go wrong? All of which should allow for you to be, uh, all of which should allow then for you to have much greater clarity on where you need to improve. So rather than just trying to like in general improve or just doing lots of debates or lots of practice speeches, you can now understand when I do a debate or when I do a practice speech, the thing I need to focus on is ensuring that I appropriately mechanize every argument because the thing that repeated adjudicators seem to have identified as a problem is not believing my arguments. Or you can identify that uh, what I need to focus on in this debate is speaking slower and being very clear because uh, my arguments are good. And when I tell them to the edge afterwards, they think the case was good. They just didn't understand that that was what I was saying. Or maybe it's just that both of those things were fine but the arguments we chose were just unstrategic and bad in the debate. We need to think more clearly about strategy in, in the prep room. Whatever that is, that is far more likely to allow you to uh, engage in targeted improvement that is likely to develop more specific and useful results.
So that is sort of the first key benefit uh, that this is likely to provide. Uh, and then uh, secondly, in terms of judge feedback, why is this likely to help you get better judge feedback? Uh, the first thing to explain is like, why is judge feedback bad in the status quo? There are a couple of reasons why, in my experience, judge feedback is often not very good in the status quo. The first thing is just that um, judges often are not paying attention to feedback when they're judging the debate. It is in and of itself a relatively difficult activity to just track what is occurring in the debate and work out who has won. And judges are under incredibly tight time pressure, which means that uh, since you're not really rewarded for feedback in and of itself, many judges just don't do it. Like they focus specifically and exclusively on working out who won the debate which means when you ask them for feedback, they're just kind of making up shit on the spot. They haven't really put a lot of thought into it. Uh, that is particularly true online where uh, judges are kind of like more distracted. It's easier to not pay attention. People are harder to understand. You lose a lot of the benefit of like gestures and so on. Secondly, uh, often the types of feedback that are easiest to deliver are identifying mistakes that people have made. Like you did not pr correctly prove this argument or uh, you sort of like uh, did something wrong here or there. Sometimes speeches are sort of like good in that they don't do anything wrong in particular. They just aren't amazing in any way. Like they identify an argument, successfully prove that argument and impact that argument, you know, a decent speech, but it could have been better. Like they could have run a better set of arguments or they could have been rhetorically nicer and so on. That is feedback that is actually just hard to give. Uh, one, for the reason that most uh, adjudicators will not pick up on that kind of feedback. As I said, there's very little time given to thinking about feedback in most adjudications, and that feedback is hard to identify. Most adjudicators can, if they put their mind to it, work out what you've done wrong, because it'll feature as part of your way. Like this argument was rebutted for this reason, or this argument was unpersuasive for this reason. But working out what could have been, it's sort of a discrete skill that many judges do not have because it requires you to sort of be better at debating than the person you're giving feedback to in some circumstances. You are essentially being asked, how would you have done this better? And if the answer is, well, I couldn't have done it better, it's very hard for you to be able to give that feedback. Um, the last reason that feedback is often bad in the status quo is just that like sometimes there are just too many things that are wrong. Uh, some debates are just bad. And the answer to like, what could I have done better is just like everything. To mean that adjures, uh, you know, but no adge really wants to be like, you sucked, do everything better. Not only is that not particularly helpful, uh, it also sounds pretty mean. So in that case, the adge will probably just like point to one thing in a sort of arbitrary fashion, which means that that feedback is not really targeted. How is How are these tools and this understanding of how debates operate likely to be able to help with that problem and allow you to get better feedback? The first thing is, it allows you to direct the feedback process so you can ask specific questions about what you want the adj to tell you. And that takes a lot of the pressure off the adjudicator for having to have in advance determined what you've done wrong and have a bit of a think about what their feedback should be, which means that adjudicators are far more likely to be able to assist you there. But secondly, a lot of the questions that you ask aren't ones that require the adjudicator to engage in deep thought about the topic, they're just questions that require the adjudicator to understand about their own, uh, to, to speak to their own personal understanding of the debate. So asking the adjudicator, did you understand this argument is a question that is very easy for the adjudicator to understand, but it's very difficult for the adjudicator in and of themselves to deliver in feedback. Because if they did not understand uh, the argument, then they probably, it is like they might not know that they didn't understand the argument. They don't know what the argument was meant to be. They might have thought that it was A, was in fact B, but they will never know in the first place. So they won't bring it up in feedback. While you obviously with an understanding of what the argument was meant to achieve and an understanding uh, at least broadly of what the adjudicator seems to have gotten from it in terms of the OA are a much better place to ask those kinds of questions. But three, you can ask sort of specific questions like, why did you weigh this argument more than this argument or less than this argument? Uh, which is something that adjudicator can easily answer because it's something that they did in the debate in and of itself, but uh, it's not really something that is easy to explain in feedback uh, in and of itself. So the overall takeaway here is just that when you ask direct questions, often uh, it's things the adjudicator wouldn't have thought about in the first place. 
things that are actually very easy for the adjudicator to understand, but often difficult for them to say off the cuff. Uh, and often it is feedback that is likely to be most useful because you can use your own self-evaluation of your debate to work out where things went wrong and then ask the adjudicator about those particular things or their thoughts on those things, which is likely to result in more targeted feedback and a higher hit rate of feedback because those are easier questions for adjudicators to answer. So in particular, when, depending on what you evaluate to be the flaws that existed in your case, you can ask the adjudicator, was there a more strategic set of arguments we could have run? Or uh, where did our analysis go, go wrong? Where do you think that you did not believe our argument was true? Or uh, why did you weigh certain things in this way or another? All of which are likely to result in you getting uh, much more specific and much more useful feedback. So that is sort of the last benefit uh, that I think this achieves for you is just that you're able to get more tailored and more useful feedback from adjudicators. So uh, that is, I believe, the... Uh, end of my presentation. So at this point in time, if anyone has any questions uh, either on this or more broadly, I'll be happy to take those.